بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله last week we finished um, حديث number one so quickly revise through حديث number one um, إن شاء الله I won't ask everything because time doesn't permit Some, quite different socket or something. Just quickly, some of the main questions. Is it working? Speakers, yeah, okay. Um, just some of the main issues, inshallah. Right. Muhib, uh, why was this hadith narrated? What's the sabab of the hadith? What's the sabab of the wurud? The story of Muhajir and the first, um, what the scholars say by starting. Now, the story of Muhajir Muqais, uh, the man who traveled to marry a woman, however, that hadith is not linked to this. Uh, that, that narration is not linked to this hadith. Right. What are the different usages of the word niyyah? Yeah. Uh, the Fuqaha, they use it to mean different normal actions to worships. And then within the second usage of Fuqaha, is worships between different types of worships. Because so the first is the Fuqaha, they have two. Yeah. So worships and normal actions and worships between themselves. The second usage? Salaf. In the Salaf and the Hadith and the uh, Tazkiyah and so on, what's that? Um, the, um, differentiating the objective of the action. The objective of the action, that's where they talk about um, sincerity. Which actions do not require a niyyah? The Tanzeer. Uh, turuk. Turuk, things that you have to leave off. Talaq. Talaq. Riyadh, uh, help him up. Doing that which is permissible and leaving that which is... Leaving off that which is haram and doing that which is permissible. But if you do have an intention, then you get rewarded. Yeah, you get rewarded. Um, what's the time of the niyyah, Qasim? Uh, no, 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 not before. What's the asal? At the time of starting action. At the time of starting action. As for before, can you have it before? You can have it before. According to? Khas, good, good at remembering. If you remember who didn't say it, khas, the rest of it. Okay, that's fine. Um, where's the place of the niya? Uh, Adam? The heart. the heart. Do you say it out loud? No. no. What about before doing Umrah, you say, Labbaik Allahumma Umrah. Isn't that saying your niya? Out loud? Right. Kabiru? Uh, it's possible. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not saying your intention out loud. It's, it's one of the rituals of uh, of Hajj al-Umrah, just like you say Allah Akbar for the beginning of, of Salah. So that's not saying your intention out loud. Okay, if I was to do an action, and let's say I pray Salah, within Salah, Shaitan comes to me and whispers and makes me change my intention from being it sincerely for Allah, and now I start to show off. What's the ruling on that Salah? Um, Very good, very good. If he fights it off, then alhamdulillah, it's good. If he doesn't fight it off, then it is. Uh, th uh, then what? Uh, next to you, what's the name? Uh, oh. If he doesn't fight it off, uh, then uh, he tries to fight off while he's doing the action. If he doesn't fight it off, though? Okay, then his action can be rejected. No. Good. It depends if the action is a connected action or if there's separate parts to it. If it's fully connected like Salah, then yes, it would be rejected. If it's other actions which are have separate parts to it, like we give the example of giving charity to 10 different people. Each time you give charity, it's a separate action. So therefore, those which are sincere are accepted and those which aren't are rejected. What are the different meanings of the word A'mal, or the two different meanings of the word A'mal in this hadith? Uh, Legislated actions. If that is the meaning, then what's the meaning of the hadith? Um, no, actions are correct or accepted due to their intentions. What's the second meaning, Riyadh? Uh, there will be actions which are, not, which are legislative. Those actions which he said legislative. Well, then all actions. All actions. And if that is the meaning, then what's the meaning of the sentence? Then really all actions. 
Was ist anything else? Das ist Und der Mehr wird rewarded uh, due to their intention. So the difference between the two is that the first one is talking about acceptance. And the second one is saying that, look, if it's an act of worship, then it says, yes, it's acceptance. But if it's other actions, then you don't need an intention. But if you do have an intention, then you may be um, rewarded. Okay, then we talked about Hijrah. What are the three types of Hijrah? Um, my migration from Mecca to Medina. From Mecca to Medina? We stopped when I was coming. Now I'm stopped. Second? Um, migration from a land of shirk to a land of Islam. Land of shirk to a land of Islam. Uh, migration from specific actions, people, times, and places. From actions, people, times, and places. Good. What's the ruling on saying Allah and His Messenger know best? Right. Uh, Sadiq. Ali. So, is it permissible when you speak to someone in Islamic issues? Now, regarding Islamic issues, you can say, as for universal issues, then you can't say it. What's the benefit of in the hadith, when it's mentioned that whoever travels to Allah and his messenger, or migrates to Allah and his messenger, then he has migrated to Allah and his messenger. What does that mean? Whoever does that gets the exact same thing. You know, that's like saying whoever opens the door has opened the door. It doesn't really make sense. So what's the hidden meaning of the hadith? Uh, next to you. What's the meaning of that sentence? Whoever migrates to Allah and his messenger, then he has migrated to Allah and his messenger. First lesson? Yeah. Right, uh, I'm not sure. Not sure. Next to you? I'm not sure. Sure. Huh. At the back? No? Right, yeah, here. What is it? If he intends it, then that's the reward he's going to get. No, so whoever intends to migrate for the sake of Allah and his messenger, then he has migrated to Allah and his messenger, i.e., in terms of reward, i.e., he will be rewarded for that action. Right. In this sentence, the first sentence mentions the, what, what the outcome is, which is the reward. But in the second sentence, when he talks about migrating to the dunya or for a woman to marry, said, Ilama hajara ilayhi. Then he has migrated to whatever he has migrated to. What's the benefit of that? That in the first sentence, he mentions the actual uh, reward. As for the second sentence, just leaves it open. Adam. It shows the, the lowly status. Of the lowly status and this praise of the dunya. No. Oh, khalas. We'll leave it as that, inshallah. Right, who's memorized uh, the hadith? We have the highest, I can see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Right, I'm going to start. Okay. Numbers? No. الحديث الثاني عن عمر رضي الله عنه أيضا قال بينما نحن إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذات يوم إذ طلع علينا رجل شديد بياد الثياب شديد سواد الشعر لا يرى لي أثر السفر ولا يعرف منا أحد حتى ولا ي ولا يعرف منا أحد ولا يعرفه سلهاب في ولا يعرفه منا أحد ولا يعرفه منا أحد حتى جلس حتى جلس حتى جلس للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسلم ركبته إلى ركبته ووضع كفيله إليه وقال يا محمد فقال يا محمد أخبرني عن الإسلام أي من أسلفت؟ فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الإسلام أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة وتسوم رمضان وتحج البيت إن استطاع إليه سبيلا قال صدى فأجبنا له ويسأله ويصدقه Okay, very good. Right. The first thing that we're going to do is read the hadith insha'Allah. I did send the worksheets about an hour or something before uh, before Maghrib. So we're on page 100 and. 
and 40 in the worksheets. Page 140 in the worksheets. So we'll just read the English, inshallah. So the second hadith, also on the authority of Umar, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, while we were one day sitting with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes and with very black hair. No traces of journeying, are you traveling, were visible on him, and none of us knew him. He sat down close by the Prophet wasallam, rested his knees against the knees of the Prophet wasallam, and placed his palms over his thighs, and said, O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. The Messenger of Allah wasallam, replied, Islam is that you should testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Worthy of worship in truth except Allah. Uh, and Muhammad وسلم, is his messenger that he should perform salah, pay the zakah, fast during Ramadan and perform hajj to the house if you can find a way to it. He said, you have spoken the truth. We were astonished at his thus questioning him وسلم, and then telling him that he was right. But he went on to say, inform me about Iman. He, the Prophet وسلم, answered, it is that you believe in Allah and his angels and his books and, and his messengers and in the last day and in fate. Let's do uh, an divine decree. An divine decree, Qadr, both in its good and in its evil aspects. He said, you have spoken the truth. Then he, the man said, inform me about Ihsan. The Prophet ﷺ answered, it is that you should serve Allah, you should worship Allah. But this translation I just got from online, that's what I'm saying. It is that you should uh, worship Allah as though you can see him, for though you... You cannot see him, yet he sees you. Okay. He said, inform me about the hour. He, the Prophet ﷺ said, about that, the one question knows no more than the questioner. So he said, well, inform me about his signs. He said, they, uh, they are that the slave girl will give birth to a mistress, and that you will see the barefooted ones, the naked, and destitute, the herdsmen of the sheep, competing one another in raising lofty buildings. Thereupon the man went, I waited a while, and he, the Prophet ﷺ, said, Oh, Umar, do you know who the questioner was? I replied, Allah and his messenger know better, oh, know best. He said, that was Jibreel, he came to teach you your religion, narrated by Muslim. So, it's a very famous hadith, hadith Jibreel. Um, but summary is that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, sat right in front of the Prophet ﷺ, and then he asked the Prophet ﷺ five questions. What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? Tell me about the hour and what are some of the signs of the hour. And then the Prophet answered. And then in the end we were informed by the Prophet ﷺ that a man who came to the Prophet was actually Jibreel ﷺ in a, form of a, in a form of a man. That's a quick summary of the hadith. And inshallah we will go through uh, each sentence uh, of the hadith once we get to the explanation of the hadith. Now this hadith, uh, as you go, we're going to learn, is uh, you know from the foundational hadith of the religion. And that's why the Prophet if you look at the end of the hadith, he said, Atakum yu'allimukum deenakum, that he came to teach you your religion. And yeah, so this hadith is the, one of the basics, or the, ba uh, the base hadith of the religion. Therefore, its explanation you know, can be a very, very detailed explanation. Now we're not going to make it very detailed. However, we are going to spend maybe about three, four lessons on this hadith. Um, insha'Allah, so that we can correctly understand every part of the hadith. And I did mention to you before that the first three ahadith, we will go into more explanation of those first three than we would do compared to the other ahadith, insha'Allah, due to the fact of how important these ahadith are, and also to the fact how famous these ahadith are. So instead of you guys just hearing this hadith again and again, and maybe the same thing over again and again, I'll try to mention more detail so that you can fully understand it, and insha'Allah, like that, you have more knowledge about this hadith. So we'll go through the stages or the steps that we mentioned that we would do uh, previously uh, when we are explaining a hadith. So the first, uh, the, the first point is the takhrij of the hadith. The takhrij of the hadith, what does takhrij mean? Uh, like uh, where, the, where it's placed. And the reference of the hadith basically, the reference of the hadith. Now this hadith is narrated in Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim. Right? And this is actually the first hadith in Sahih Muslim. It's the first hadith in Sahih Muslim. Now, sometimes you might see the reference of this hadith 
as hadith number 8 in Sahih Muslim. If you do see it as number 8, why is it numbered as 8? For numbers, we mentioned this in the hadith. Not that it's repeated, no. Sorry? Very good. Imam Muslim rahimahullah has an introduction. Now that introduction is not part of uh, his book, right? Uh, his actual book and the conditions of the authentic hadith start from the beginning of the book, but not from the introduction, right? Because in, in the introduction, there are some weaker hadith and he speaks about many different topics and so on, right? So there are some ulama who counted the hadith from the introduction itself, right? So if you come from the, in, from the introduction, then it's not the first hadith. But if you look at um, if you look at where the book actually starts from after the introduction, then it is the first hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Right, so that's the takhrij of the hadith, very simple, that it is the first hadith of Sahih Muslim. <coughs> now hadith benefits, so some other benefits. So the takhrij was just a reference. Now some more hadith benefits related to this hadith. This hadith is the first hadith in Sahih Muslim, as we mentioned. Therefore, the first hadith in this book, in Arba'in al was the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. So the, hadith, the last hadith we took, Innam al-A'mal bin Niyat, the first hadith that we took, that was also the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. And the second hadith that we are taking is the first hadith in Sahih Muslim. And that also shows the importance of uh, these ahadith. So the first hadith in the 40 hadith of Nawi is the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. And the second hadith in the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi is the first hadith in Sahih Muslim. And this hadith is from Afrad Muslim. Now what does Afrad Muslim mean? A.E. Afrad from the word Fard. Fard means like single, singular. A.E. Whenever you hear the word Afrad in the sense of hadith, it means that that author is the one who is the only one who, who uh, narrated that hadith. And normally when you say Afrad Muslim, it's in comparison to Bukhari. In simple terms, Afrad Muslim, i.e. those ahadith which Imam Muslim narrated, that Imam Bukhari didn't. Those ahadith that Imam Muslim narrated, that Imam Bukhari didn't. So there are some ahadith which are muttafaqun alayhi, agreed upon, narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. So they're in both. But then there are those ahadith which are, which are Afrad Bukhari, those ahadith only narrated by Bukhari, and then you have those ahadith which are Afrad Muslim, only narrated by Imam Muslim. So therefore, uh, this hadith has only been narrated by Imam Muslim. However, it's only been narrated by Imam Muslim on the authority of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, i.e. when the companion who was, who was narrating this hadith was Umar radiallahu anh. As for another narration from the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, then that is narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. So another, another version of the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira is by Bukhari and Muslim. And if the narrator is different, i.e. the companion is different, it's considered two separate hadith. And what shows that as well is that if you look at the different narrations of this hadith from other companions, Abu Huraira, and in other books, there's one by Abu Dhar, and one by Abu Zara, right? You'll find that the wording is quite different as well. The wording is quite different. Why? Because it's a different companion narrating it. This is a story. He came in, then he did this, and then. So they'll use different words, right? So, for example, I think it was in the. Narration of Abu Huraira and uh, Abu Zara'ah and Abu Dhar, they said, فَتَخَطَّى So instead of saying, he came and sat in front of Prophet they said, he came and he approached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فَبَرَكَ And then he sat down. Baraka is how a camel you sits down. So he sat down on his knees, uh, or on the hands, depending on the interpretation. بَيْنَ uh, يَدَيْهِ Between the hands, he sat between the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you see the wording is quite different. So that's why, uh, if a, the companion is different, it's considered two separate ahadith. It's not considered the same hadith. Now, so the summary is that the hadith has only been narrated by Imam Muslim if you look at it from the authority of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh. But if you look at it from other companions, then it's narrated by others. And if you look at it from Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, then it is narrated by Bukhari and and Muslim. Now, uh, the narration of uh, Abu Huraira. Hadith number 50 in Bukhari and Hadith number 9 in Muslim. Hadith number 50 in Bukhari and Hadith number 9 in Muslim. Um, I've got Hadith number 9 written here, but I think it's, I mean, that's included in the introduction. So therefore, it'll be 
If you don't count the introduction, it will be hadith number two. Yeah? So it will be hadith number two. Right? Hadith number two. If you don't count the introduction. So be very careful with the, with the uh, narrations of Sahih Muslim, the numbers. Sometimes they include the intro, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they'll count, if a hadith is repeated, they'll count each repeated hadith as a separate number. And some scholars say, no, it's, it's, it's all one, you know, one hadith. So they'll count five different narrations of the same as one hadith. And some will count it as five separate. So be careful. Sometimes different prints have different numbers on it. Right, the status of this hadith. Now, Alhamdulillah, I've written out all the statements for that. So you just have to read it. Now, I'd like to mention to you that this hadith is from the foundation of the hadith of the religion. Qadi Iyad, he says, this hadith comprises of all functions of worship, internal and external, from the compacts of Iman in the beginning, middle and end, from the actions of the limbs and from the sincerity of the secrets and protection of the corruption of actions. To an extent, verily all the Islamic sciences return back to it and are filled with it. Imam Al-Qurtubi, Imam al Qurtubi's statement is very good. He says, it is befitting to label this hadith as the mother of the sunnah due to what it contains from different knowledges of the Sunnah. Just as Surah Al-Fatiha is called the mother of the Qur'an due to what it contains from the meanings of the Qur'an. The Arabs, if they had something, right, which is like something, you know, the most important or the, or the origin of something, they would call it Ummu something, the mother of whatever they are talking about. So for example, one of the names of Mecca was Ummul Qura, the mother of the villages. Why? Because everyone used to go to that village. Uh, I, you know, they all used to go to Mecca for business and everything. Why? Because the Kaaba was there. Like Surah Al-Fatiha is known as Ummul Quran, the mother of the Quran, because they say if you look at the main teachings of the Quran, all of them can be summarized within Surah Al-Fatiha. Likewise, this hadith can also be called Ummul Sunnah, the mother of the Sunnah. Because if you look at all of the Sunnah, then it can be summarized into this hadith. Obviously, it's not going to contain everything, but if you want one hadith that would, you know, cover everything, or at least the most important parts, then it would be this hadith. On the next page, Imam al-Nawi, rahimahullah, he says, know that this hadith combines different types of sciences, knowledges, manners, and benefits. Rather, it is the foundations of Islam. And lastly, Imam Rajab, he says, it is a great hadith. It consists of the explanation of the deen, and of the religion, in entirety. Due to this, the Prophet said in the end of the hadith, this was Jibreel, he came to teach you your religion after explaining the levels of Islam, the levels of Iman, and the levels of Ihsan. So he made all of, the, all of that the religion. Okay? So these statements are all indicating towards one thing, which is what? Which is that this hadith is the foundation and the summary of the, of the religion. Right. The narrator of this hadith is... Umar radiallahu anhu. Now we've already talked about Umar in the first hadith. So we don't need to repeat talking about Umar. However, what we can do is mention something. In the first hadith, when the author, if you go back to it, when the author, he introduces Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, An Amir al-Mu'minina Abi Hafsin Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu qal. Mentions like the full name and title of Umar. On the authority of the leader of the believers, Abu Hafs, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him, he said, the whole title. However, here, what did he say? He says, and I'll put it down for you, and Umar radiallahu anhu aydan qal. On the authority of Umar, he also said. On the authority of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he also said. So he summarized it. And this is the methodology of the majority of the scholars. If the same narrator, or if a narrator who has passed is being mentioned again, then they don't repeat the whole thing again. Right? They suffice, right? We mentioned detail the first time, khlas. next time we don't need to mention that detail again. Anyone wants detail, they go back to uh, the previous place. So the first place, he mentioned his name, his kunya, his title. The second hadith, he just mentioned his name. And sometimes, some scholars even shorten it even more than that. And they'll say, وَعَنْهُ Just, وَعَنْهُ On the authority of him. And move on. Right? On the authority of him. Instead of on the authority of Umar. Instead of mentioning the name again, him, because it's very short. Wa'anhu, Umar, wa'anhu. Wa'anhu, wa'anhu, wa'anhu. So if, let's say the same narrator is narrating five hadiths, wa'anhu, wa'anhu, wa'anhu. It's a lot shorter and it's a lot easier. So that's why some scholars uh, 
to do that. And there are some ulama that, you know, they don't get tired of repeating, so every time they just write the whole thing again and again and again and again. And both have their uh, benefits. Especially if, you know, let's say you're on ha halfway through the book and Umar comes again. Now, if somebody's just reading that hadith, he's not really going to know much about Umar, right? But uh, if he, they repeat it again, خلاص, everything is there. But if there's a person studying it, then he knows, you know, it's, it'll save paper, it might save the book from that thick to that thick. It also saves, you know, the pain of writing in the hand of the person who's writing because authoring is not easy, you know, it, it takes a lot of time. So, uh, this is what the scholars do when it comes to, when it comes to that. Right. The reason of narration of this hadith. Now, Sabah al Wurud. Now, Sabah al Wurud, we said, is the reason why the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said what he said. Yeah? Now, that is quite straightforward. Why did the Prophet ﷺ say what he said? Because Jibreel ﷺ came to him and asked him those questions. So the Prophet ﷺ was answering those questions. However, what's more important for this hadith, right, is the second thing, which is sababu tahdith which is sababu tahdith What is sababu tahdith Who can remind me? Huh? What to do with the hadith? The reasoning for why the hadith was invented. By who? By the companions onwards. Sabab the Rud is why it was narrated by the Prophet. Sabab the Hadith is why it's narrated by the companions. So the Prophet said what he said. Now, why is the companion saying that hadith? Okay? Now, it, it may be the case that he's just saying it because he wants to say it. But for the sum of hadith, there's a reason, there's a story behind it. And this story, Imam Muslim rahimahullah, actually mentions, mentions it in uh, the first hadith of Sahih Muslim. Okay, and it was actually Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, radiallahu anhu, uh, anhu ma, who narrated it. Okay, so, I mean, if you just go online and type in this hadith of the narration of Sahih Muslim, you'll find it all there. So I'm just going to read it, I'll just quickly type it in my phone, literally right now, uh, and I've got it on sunnah.com. So I'll just read it from there, inshallah, yeah? Um... Just to save time, I'll just read the English. It's narrated on the authority of Yahya ibn Ya'mar that the first man who discussed Al-Qadr divine decree in Basra was Ma'bad al-Juhani. I, along with Humayd ibn Abdurrahman al-Himyari, set out for pilgrimage or for Umrah and said, should it so happen that we come in contact with one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu wasallam, we shall ask him about Al-Qadr. Accidentally, we came across Abdullah ibn Umar whilst he was entering the masjid. My companion and I surrounded him meaning one on the left, one on the right. One of us stood on his right and the other stood on his left. I expected that my companion would authorize me to speak. I therefore said, O Abu Abdurrahman, and Ibn Umar, there have appeared some people in our land who recite the Quran and pursue knowledge. And then after talking about their affairs, added, they, I and mean, those people claim that, that, there, that there is no such thing as defined decree. And events are no, not predestined. Uh, destined. He, Abdullah Ibn Umar said, when you happen to meet such people, tell them that I have nothing to do with them and they have nothing to do with me. And verily, they are in no way responsible for my belief. Abdullah ibn Umar swore by Allah, uh, if any of them who does not believe in divine decree had with him gold equal to the bulk of the man Uhud and spent it in the way of Allah, Allah would not accept it unless he affirmed his faith in divine decree. He further said, my, fa my, he further said, my father Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, told me, and he mentioned the hadith. Right. I'll summarize it. What happened? There were two people who came from Basra, which is in Iraq. And they had an issue. There was a man called Ma'bad al-Juhani. There was a man called Ma'bad al-Juhani. And he took this belief from others. We'll go into the details of it later, inshallah. But he was spreading a doubt, which is that there is no such thing as Qadr. There's no such thing as divine decree. Nothing has been predestined before. وَأَنَّ الْأَمْرَ unuf. I.e., he would claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not know what's going to happen until it happens. He, he would claim that Allah does not know what's going to happen. Allah doesn't know the future until it happens. Once it happens and Allah has witnessed it, then he knows what's happened. Right? So he's negating divine decree. And he's negating the knowledge of Allah. So these two men came to Abdullah ibn Umar. You know, they were looking for any companion and they found Abdullah ibn Umar. Because they wanted a fatwa, they wanted the ruling of these people. 
So they asked Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Umar refuted them. And he basically did takfir of them, meaning he claimed them to be disbelievers. He claimed them to be disbelievers. How is that? In two ways. Firstly, he said, I am free from them and they are free from me. And that is not said, you know, except generally to mushrikun and disbelievers. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, where he called Ibrahim alayhi salam, where he called Ibrahim I am free from what you are doing. Or something along those lines, I can't remember the exact ayah. And the second thing that he said is that if they were to give in sadaqah, the equivalent of gold, equivalent to Mount Uhud, it wouldn't be accepted from by them. And actions are not accepted by only the one who has fallen into, into kufr. And so therefore that shows us these two points. Abdullah bin Umar was considering, considering these people to be Disbelievers And why is that? He mentions the proof He mentions this hadith Now he mentions the whole of hadith Jibreel He mentions the whole of hadith Jibreel But why is he mentioning the hadith? Which part of the hadith is needed? Good When the person was asked about Iman And he mentions the six pillars of Iman One of the pillars was Qadr, qadr To believe in Qadr So <coughs> from the pillars of a person's Iman Is that he has to believe in Al Qadr and if a person doesn't believe in that, then he has not believed in one of the pillars of Iman. Therefore, he's not considered a, a Muslim. Right? Um, so that is basically a you know, quick summary of why this hadith was, was narrated. And inshallah, once we get to Al-Qadr in the hadith, we'll speak about it in more detail. But that's the sabab of the hadith. That's the reason why Ibn Umar narrated the hadith. Right? And he says that I heard from my father, who, and then he mentioned the rest of the Hadith. Right, then it says here Nisbatul Hadith, the attribution of this hadith. Uh, the point what I mean by attribution of hadith is this hadith is famously known as Hadith Jibreel. Hadith of Jibreel. Now the hadith sometimes you know they, they, they're given titles. A hadith are given titles. Sometimes they are, they are attributed to the narrator, right? And that happens a lot in fiqh when they're discussing a hadith. They say there's one main hadith uh, in a certain ruling. And they'll say, well, the hadith of Ibn Umar is like this. And the hadith of Abu Huraira is like this. That's how they'll refer to the hadith. So they'll use the name of the narrator of the hadith. Sometimes it's to do with the story of the hadith. Like over here. So over here, it's because Jibreel islam came to the Prophet ﷺ in the form of a man. Asking him questions, and that doesn't normally take place, right? Jibreel doesn't normally come like that. So, therefore, the name of this hadith is given due to the story of what took place within this hadith. Right, we come now to some of the hard words, which is gharib al hadith. And like I mentioned to you last lesson, in English, you don't really need to worry about gharib al hadith as much, but we'll mention it because the ulama do mention it, and likewise. Anyone who is learning the Arabic language, especially if they're memorizing the hadith and so on, it's important to know what these words mean. So I will we'll, you know, explain these are hadith. Um, uh, sorry, these words, because they're not as common as maybe some of the other words. So the first word is Bainama. Bainama means, who knows? Huh? Between, it's hard to give you a warmer translation, but Bainama is basically referring to a specific time when something suddenly happens. It's referring to a time when something suddenly happens. Depending on the context, you translate it accordingly. So this hadith, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ عِنْدَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ You know, between, as we were sitting with the Prophet a man came in. So what's the answer you get for بَيْنَمَا? You can, you can write, if you want a translation, as, as, you know, as we were doing X, Y, and Z, or between doing X, Y, and Z. But the best thing to do is give it a description, which is, it refers to a time when something takes place suddenly. It refers to a time when something takes place suddenly. And then depending on the context, you translate it appropriately. Then according to the context, you translate it appropriately. Right, the second one is Atharu As-Safar. Athar means like the effects. What Athar means effects. 
So, and what he means here is, يعني, and suffer is traveling. The effects of suffer, the ex- effects of traveling, i.e., the signs of traveling, i.e., what is intended in this context is the signs of uh, traveling. Right? So, for example, if a person's walking, then they'll say in his left footprints, they'll say that's his athar, that's what he's left behind. Okay, that, that's what the word athar actually means, that, you know, to leave something behind like that. So, athar or suffer, i.e., the effects. That traveling has left behind on that person. Yeah? And that's why Athar. Well, athar means narrations normally, right? <coughs> why is what that person has said and what is left behind? Right, and it's about the hour. The hour is referring to the day of judgment. It's referring to the day of judgment. Now sa'a doesn't when we say hour, it doesn't literally mean sixty minutes. It just means a short period of time. It just means a short period of time. Obviously it's short compared to you know, eternity in Jannah. Why in Hellfire? Amaratiha. Amara or Amaratuha. A'i alamatuha. Signs. So when the person was asked, Akhbrini an Amaratiha, inform me about its signs, i.e., the signs of the judgment, then Amara is referring to signs. And they say the difference between the word alama and Amara is that it's a sign for something which is close. Uh, something which is going to take place close, closely. There is also another word which is in the Quran for signs, especially talking about the signs of the judgment, which is ashrat. Ashrat. فَقَدَ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا Hamza Shin Ra Alif Ta. Right. The next word is what's the next word? Who can read it? Ummah. Not Ummah. That's what I put a Fatha and I mean. Al Amah. Al Amah. I put that Fatha and for a reason. Al Amah means slave girl. Al Amah means slave girl. That's why for a boy we would say Abdullah, the slave of Allah. But for a girl you say Amatullah. We don't say Abdullah, we say Amatullah, the female slave of Allah. Right, Rabbataha, her uh, mistress, her mistress. Once you get to that part of the hadith, it'll explain what it means. But the word Rabb, linguistically, can also refer to somebody who is owning something. Yeah? So, Ar-Rabb, the Lord, yani the Rabb is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is permissible to use it if you attribute it to something specific. For example, if... Uh, Let's say your father owns a house. He's Rabbul Bayt. He's Rabbul Bayt. He's the, the, the master of the house. And it's permissible to say that. Only if you attribute it to that specific thing. As for unrestricted, then that's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, Rabbataha, her mistress, يعني, the one in charge of the, of the female slave. Al-Hufah. Al-Hufah is referring to those who are barefoot. Plural of the word Hafi. Plural of the word Hafi. Then we have Urah. Urah means naked, i.e., no clothes. Which is plural of the word Al Ari. Which is plural of the word Al Ari. And then we have Al Ala. Al Ala means the poor. Poor. Which is plural of the word Al Ail. Al Ail. And lastly, Maliyan means a long time. A long time. Falabistu, I remained Maliyan for a long time. I stayed back for a long time. Okay, so these are meanings of some of these words. Like I said, I'm not really going to test you on this either. So don't worry about them too much. Uh, because it doesn't really... Um, you know, concern somebody who just, just knows English. Any words that do need an explanation, <coughs> I'll explain it in the actual explanation. Like last week, we took A'mal, the two, two different opinions and so on. That I'll go into detail with them. But this is like an extra benefit because it's mentioned in the books of the scholars and also um, it's good to know for those who are trying to memorize in Arabic or even read in Arabic. Right, now we can actually start going through the different Ahadith. Okay? 
uh, different sentences in the hadith. No, actually, we missed one out. Al Ma'an al Ijmali, the general meaning of the hadith. So just before we go through the sentences, the general meaning of the hadith. The general meaning of the hadith is that Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam five questions regarding the religion. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam spoke about firstly the, the levels of the religion, the levels of the religion, or the three levels of the religion, which is Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And then talked about some of the minor signs of Day of Judgment. Some of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment. Okay, so these, if you want to summarize the hadith, these three points. Jibreel alayhi salam came and asked the Prophet salam five questions. Second point, Prophet salam explained the three levels of the religion. And then the third point, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned two of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment. Which both indicate towards the changing of times. Both of them indicate towards the changing of times. Don't worry, we'll explain that when you get there, inshallah. Right, now we can actually start the actual explanation of the hadith. So everything before was just like an introduction to the hadith. Now we can actually start with the uh, actual explanation of the hadith. So the author he says, and Umar radiallahu anhu aydan qal. Also the authority Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, we already explained a bit about that. بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ ذَاتَ يَوْمُ While we were one day sitting with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now this part of the hadith, you know, there's a lot of benefits. Umar رضي الله عنه, what's he saying? He's saying that us, the companions of the Messenger, one day we were just sitting with the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now, even within that small statement, there's a lot of benefits that we contain. We can take. The first benefit, it shows the good manners, the humility, and the love of benefiting of by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, it shows the good manners of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he would sit with his companions, right? And he would have that humility. So he wouldn't say that I'm the pro- I'm a prophet. You're not. I can't sit with you guys. You know, no. But rather, of the humility of the Prophet sallam, he would sit with them. And if you look at other narrations, sometimes the Prophet would sit with them in such a way that if somebody was to walk in, they couldn't even tell who the Prophet was. And in fact, when the Prophet did Hijrah to, to Medina, the people were actually going up to Abu Bakr, and they weren't going to the Prophet because they couldn't tell. Like, I, I can't remember 100%. Maybe the reason was, at that time, it was Abu Bakr who was, who was, who was riding, and the Prophet was walking because they were taking turns. But I'm not 100% sure, I can't remember. But whatever the reason was, they couldn't tell who the Prophet ﷺ was. So it's not like the Prophet ﷺ, he's saying, I'm a Prophet, you have to treat me in a certain way, like, you know, how kings have, and he has, he has to be in a certain chair and wear certain clothes, or, you know, just so he has to stand up. But rather, from the humility of the Prophet ﷺ, is that he will sit with his uh, companions. And also, it shows the love of benefiting. Because the Prophet ﷺ, when he would sit with his companions, what would they talk about? They talk about the religion. And the Prophet ﷺ would teach them. And they would ask questions. And the narrations of them are, are many. And that also shows us that you know, we're nowhere near the level of the Prophet ﷺ. So you know, we should have even more humility and humbleness. And as the Prophet ﷺ, he says that uh, no one has that humility for Allah except that Allah raises him. Nobody has humility for Allah except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises him. Right, the second benefit, this shows a love for learning or wanting to learn and wanting to have good companionship by the companions of Allah Right, so just like it shows goodness from the side of the Prophet وسلم, it also shows goodness from the side of the companions. That they would actually take their time out and go and sit with the Prophet وسلم, and want to learn from the Prophet وسلم, and want to sit not with you know, somebody who may have a lot of money or status in society, but rather were somewhere where he can benefit and learn about the religion and get closer to Allah. So they would, you know, take time out and they would go and learn with the Prophet Sallallahu So therefore, you know, how many people are there who claim to want good but when there's a lesson going on or a certain sheikh has come, they don't go and attend those lessons, right? Or they'll attend the first one and then just drop out, right? But in fact, the companions were the opposite. They would constantly want to go and learn with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Especially when some of them 
were really busy as well, right? Like Umar radiallahu an, it's narrated that Umar radiallahu an, it's narrated in Bukhari Muslim. Um, he said that me and my neighbor from the Ansar, we used to take turns in going to meet the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One day he would go, and I'll be busy in my business or whatever. He, one day he would go learn from the Prophet, and then he would come back and teach me what he learned. The next day I would go, and he would look after the business or whatever he had to do, and I would go to the Prophet, and then I would come back and teach him what I learned from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Sahaba were busy; they had busy, they had lives, they had families, and so on, right? But that didn't stop them from learning from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whatever opportunity they had, they would work together in learning from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the third benefit. And this is something that uh, Ibn Athim rahimahullah mentions, which is that it is permissible to sit with people who are above you in knowledge to benefit from them. That there's no problem in that whatsoever, but with a condition. And the condition is that you don't waste this time. The condition is, is that you don't waste this time. There are many people, they maybe don't give importance to their time. So they'll go and what they'll do is that they will sit with a certain sheikh or a teacher and then Talk about everything and anything. And now the good man as a teacher will just remain quiet and he'll answer your questions because if he doesn't, people start saying, oh, he's rude or whatever. So our good man is, he'll stay there. But, you know, that teacher, he's got better things to do than just talk about, you know, X, Y, and Z. He needs to go research, he needs to go look after his family, he needs to learn, he needs to do so many different things. So therefore, if you are sitting with a scholar or a teacher, then keep in mind uh, the importance of his time. And don't sit there more than uh, necessity. And even in the Prophet Sallallahu the ayat came down regarding this. People go to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu he was shy of saying to the people, like, listen, I've got stuff to do. So even an ayah came down, what was the ayah? I can't remember the ayah right now, but an ayah came down uh, addressing the believers not to basically you know, go to the Prophet Sallallahu at certain times and not to waste his time and so on. If you've got a need, do you need? And straight away, leave, because the Prophet Sallallahu has other responsibilities that he needs to fulfill. So that is in regards to the first part of the hadith. Now we move on to the next page. We move on to the next part of the hadith. إِذْ طَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلْ شَدِيدُ بَيَضِ السِّيَابِ شَدِيدُ سُوَادِ الشَّعْرِ لَا يُرَى عَلَيْهِ أَثَرُ السَّفَرِ وَلَا يَعْرِفُهُ مِنَّا أَحَدٍ There appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes and with very black hair, no traces of journeying, yani traveling, were visible on him and none of us knew him. So now this is the next part of this hadith. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that the Sahaba were, we were all sitting with the Prophet sallallahu Then suddenly this man came. Now the word man, as you can see written here, is mubham, ambiguous. Now who is this man? Obviously at the end of the hadith we learned that this man was Jibreel alayhi salam. But at this time, it's ambiguous. Nobody knew who he was. And this, when you do not know who a person in the chain of narration, or even in the text itself, in the story itself, is, then the technical term for that, in the sense of hadith, is mubham. Is mubham. So it's where the narrator would say, a man came, a Bedouin came. But who was he? We don't know. Right? That is known as mubham, in the sense of hadith. And you know there are books on this. Um, who are the you know mubhamat? Who are the people who are mubham in a hadith? Uh, Ibn Hajar when he explained Fath al-Bari, that's one thing that he very he was very uh, he did very well. Anyone who is mubham, he did a lot of research in trying to work out who that person was. There's another word which I've written for you here as well, which is muhmal. You had mubham, and then we've got muhmal with a lamb. Who knows the difference between the two? Not plural. Muhmal is where the name is mentioned of the person. But you can't differentiate between him and others. His name is mentioned, but you can't tell exactly who he is. For example, Haddathana Sufyan. It was narrated to us by Sufyan. Right? Is that Sufyan authority or Sufyan Bi'ina? We don't know. We have to work it out from the chain and so on. Okay? It was narrated to us by Muhammad. Right? Who, is, who is this Muhammad? Right? Uh, and so on. That is known as Muhammad. So anyways, with it, okay, so this, in, in this hadith, a man came to us. 
Is this muhmal or mubham? Mubham. Because there's no name, nothing mentioned. That's mubham. Right? Okay, good. Right. And then the description of this man is mentioned. Shadidu bayad al thiyab, shadidu sawad al sha'ar. He had extremely white clothes on. So his thobe or the clothes that he was wearing were extremely white. Shadidu sawad al sha'ar and his hair was extremely black. Yes. Now, the ulama here mentioned a benefit. Which is, you know, Jibreel Alayhi Islam, he came to Prophet Sallam asking him questions about the religion. So he came as a student of knowledge. Right? That's why in this hadith you can take many benefits regarding the ethics of a student of knowledge. Here we learn a benefit. Which is what? That a student of knowledge should give importance to his appearance and the way he addresses, he addresses himself. And especially when coming to lessons or going to the masjid, he should wear the best clothes that he can. A student of knowledge should give importance to his appearance. And, especially when coming to the masjid or to lessons, wear the best clothes that he can. They are not mentioned when he took the hadith Torah about Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Before he would narrate a hadith, he would go have a shower, comb his hair, everything. And then he would sit down and narrate a hadith. Right? So Jibreel alayhi salam, here he came wearing the best clothes that he can. Now some people, what do they do? Because they're coming to the masjid, they'll come in their pajamas or they'll come wearing all sorts, right? But when they go to a meeting, uh, job meeting, right, then they wear the best clothes. But when they come to a meeting with Allah, then whatever. Right? A student of knowledge shouldn't be like that. Now, does that mean a student of knowledge needs to wear the most expensive clothes? No, it doesn't mean that. You know, according to what a person can afford and according to uh, their ability, without wearing those clothes which are, uh, you know, which without being extravagant. Right? He wears good, nice, neat clothes. And subhanAllah, so recently I was reading the biography of, of like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmed. And one thing I saw in their biographies is that people would say that I've not seen anyone anzafu badanan, who you know, was the most clear, uh, cleanest, more, most uh, hygienic, and didn't have the most whitest of thobes than this person. And I was shocked. I was like, okay, this is a great Imam. You know, I would expect uh, it to be written that he had tatty clothes. He was like this. He didn't care about how he presented himself. You know, I, would, I was expecting something like that. But the opposite was there, is that they would look after their, uh, their appearance and they would wear the best clothes that they could. Okay. Why are these descriptions... Uh, okay, uh, before we get to that question. لا يرى عليه أثر السفر The effects or the traces of... That's a better translation actually. Traces. The traces of journeying or traveling could not be seen on him. ولا يعرفه منا أحد and nobody from, from, from amongst us, yeah, none of his companions knew who he was. Right. These are four, you know, sentences or four phrases. Had the whitest of clothes, blackest of hair. There were no signs of traveling and none of us knew. Why is Umar radiallahu an mentioning these descriptions? To show the amazement of the Sahaba regarding who this man was. Because Medina was very small at the time. Everyone knew everyone. Everybody knew everyone. You know how big Mashhad Nabi is now, including the courtyard. That's how big Medina was at the time. If you are living there, plus everyone knows who everyone is. So, he came in wearing good clothes, right? But yet nobody knows who he is. No one recognizes him. So what does that mean? If he's not from around here, where is he from? He's from outside. That means he must have, must have traveled. But there were no traces of traveling upon him. And you know, back in those days, if you were to travel on a camel, you can tell your hair is all over the place and you got sand all over you. Abu Jamil knows, remember when he went for Umrah? He went cold biking in the, in, the, in the desert. And he came back and one of the brothers, Fashi Ahmed, uh, Brother Ahmed, right? He sand all over him, right? In his hair and his clothes, everything. We made a video of it. We made a video on Instagram and so on, right? Showing that, okay, when somebody would travel, that's how they would look. Uh, that, that, that's, that's basically the meaning of this hadith That he didn't look like that Okay So Umar is confused And the Sahaba are confused That okay he's got no signs of travelling Meaning he's from here But no one knows him Right 
So they're confused. Like, is he from me? Is he not from me? You know, and obviously the reason for that is because it was Jibreel alayhi salam, right? But that was something which confused the companions of Allahu and him. And there are other things that are going to come which confuse the companions as well. Right. The next part of the text, before we take the next part, is Salah Hafast. Salah Hafast? Do that now. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله. Okay, then the narrator Umar رضي الله عنه he says حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسند ركبتيه إلى ركبتيه ووضع كفيه على فخذيه. He sat down close to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, rested his knees against his knees of the Prophet, and placed his palms, يعني his palms. Over his thighs. Right. Firstly, the word ila. Now, in the Arabic, the word ila literally it would translate to he sat to the Prophet. Right? And that word ila basically indicates towards how close he came and sat with the Prophet. Right? So he didn't come and sit far away from the Prophet. And, you know, as it says here, he rested his knees against the knees of the Prophet. That's how close he was sitting. That's how close he was saying that the knees were, they were touching. Right. From that we can learn that Jibreel alayhi salam, when he came, he went directly and sat where? In front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa What does that show? That shows us a number of things. Firstly, it shows us in the respect that if you have a scholar or a person of knowledge or a teacher, that firstly you go and you, you go to them straight away. Right? You don't start talking to everybody else and make that person the last person that you... Um, that, that you meet Obviously Looking at the situation Sometimes if you you, know, if you go past Like it's on your way You give Islam to others And it's normal From the situation You can understand That's fine But generally That respect Has to be given to Especially the scholars Because the scholars are The inheritors of the prophets So you give them that status And the second thing Is choosing the best scholar to ask Did Jibreel alayhi salam Now go to Umar radiallahu anhu Or Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Or you know, whoever else may have been there Or did he go to the most knowledgeable person there Who was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? He went to the most knowledgeable Right? So therefore we learn in that When you have a question You should go to the person Who you deem to be the most knowledgeable And the most trustworthy You go and ask the one who is the most knowledgeable And the most trustworthy And once you've got an answer from them The khlas You don't need to go around asking other people some people do that, they'll ask one person a question and then they'll go and ask somebody else the exact same question and ask the third person the same question and normally it's not, it's done because the person is basically trying to find a way out he's trying to find an answer, a fatwa so that he, he's got a way out to do what he wants okay, and that's not the way that should be done and the second negative impact of that is that it can cause fitna or however this person said this, this person said this you know, and it happens, somebody comes and asks you a question you take time out to research and so on, you give them an answer However, this person said this. I right, go and ask that person. Why are you asking me? Right? You ask one person, khalas. You act upon it. And on top of that, it's going to confuse you, you yourself. If you get two conflicted answers, you're not going to know what to do. So if you need to answer something, you ask the person who you trust the most. You ask the one that you deem to be the most knowledgeable. And as long as he's given you an answer from the Quran, Sunnah, khalas, act upon it. And you're not obliged to do anything more than that anyway. You're just making life more harder for you if you're going around asking every single person that you come across. The third benefit is where Jibreel where he sat. Now Jibreel he sat where? 
right in front of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he sat right in front of the Prophet ﷺ showing what? Showing where a stool of knowledge should be sitting. I.e. right close and next to a teacher. Not at the back against the walls or further away. Right? They come and they sit right in front of the teacher. So when you have a khutbah, when you have a lesson, you shouldn't be sitting at the back. You should be sitting right at the front. And like you mentioned, that this could be a principle. Right? That from the things that Jibreel ﷺ has done, we mentioned a couple, we're going to mention a few more, is that you could say that one of the objectives of Jibreel ﷺ coming to the Prophet ﷺ to ask him these questions was to also teach us the etiquette of a student of knowledge. To also teach us the etiquette of a student of, of knowledge. <coughs> right, if you turn over to the next page, uh, there's another hadith that I mentioned which shows the importance of this as well. So the Prophet was sitting in a masjid with his companion and three people came to him. Two of them stepped forward to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the third one went, went away. Those two men stood by the side of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one of them found a space in the circle and he filled it whilst the other sat behind him. So three men basically came into the masjid. <coughs> Imagine we have a lesson right now. One of them, he saw the lesson and he got off. He went. The other person saw, right, there's a gap here, came and sat right there. And the other person became very shy, he just sat at the back. Okay? So what did the Prophet say? He says, when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, finished, he said, Shall I not inform you about these three people? One of them sought refuge with Allah, and Allah gave him refuge. Meaning, that this person يعني, went towards Allah, and he came and sat right, you know, right at the front. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that refuge. Just as he went towards Allah, Allah came towards him. As a second person, he felt shy, so Allah showed, was shy from him, i.e. showed kindness to him. At least the second person, uh, okay, shyness, he sat there, but it's still good. That's still something good, right? But it's not the same as the first one. And then the third person, he turned away, so Allah SWT turned away from him. So this hadith is up, itself shows what? That we should be sitting as close as we can to the, to the teacher. Right, we've got another question, which is on the next page, on page 149. If you look at the wording of the hadith, he says, فَأَسْنَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ لَا رُكْبَتَيْ وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَى فَخِذَيْ That Jibreel placed his palms upon his thighs. Right. The second, his. Is it referring to Jibreel a.s. himself? Or is it referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He placed his hands or his palms upon his thighs. I.e. on his own thighs, or upon the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ. Now many mention, many people have explained this hadith, they mention that it's his own thighs, like Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah, and others, and many others. However, what seems to be stronger is that he actually plays his hands upon the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ. And why does that seem to be stronger? Because of different narrations. Other narrations specifically mention this point, and I mention some of them here. Right? So if you read what it says, it says, Due to what has been narrated, such as the narration in the Sunan al Kubra by Imam al Nasa'i, which is not the what Sunan al Kubra is it the famous Sunan al Nasa'i? No, no, the Sughra is a famous one. So, this is not the book by Imam al Nasa'i. Uh, within that, he says that of this hadith, the narration, until he places his hand upon the knees of the Messenger of Allah. Right? And it's also Dara Qutni and there's other hadith as well. So in other narrations, and this narration Imam Al-Bani authenticated it as well. In other narrations, what's clearly mentioned? That he placed his hands upon the thighs of the Prophet Sallallahu so not upon his own, own thighs. And then here there's a statement of Ibn Hajr as well, where he explains the same thing. I just mentioned the first part of it, but it's actually a long statement. So, the reason for that, and the ulama say, okay, why did he place his hands on the thighs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, they mention one of two things, either to for mubalagha, for just to show extra emphasis on how close you should be sitting to the teacher. And some ulama have said, it's actually to show that, uh, you know how Jibreel came in in the beginning and the Sahaba don't know who he is. So this was like another of those things to show that he's not from around here. Because the Bedouins, 
is basically to make them think that he was a Bedouin. Because the Bedouins normally do things which aren't, uh, you know, the people of the city, the ethics that they would normally have, they wouldn't really do everything according to that. Like we're going to come to shortly, um, on the next page, inshallah, where he, when he addresses the Prophet ﷺ, he calls him by his name, Ya Muhammad, instead of saying, O oh, Messenger of Allah. One of the reasons for that, as we're going to get to, is to show that he's a Bedouin, because that's how the Bedouins used to address the Prophet. Right, how did the Prophet ﷺ, actually, uh, how did Jibreel ﷺ sit in front of the Prophet ﷺ? What seems to be strongest, because it's mentioned in the statement of Ibn Hajar, of Suleiman at Taymi in that narration, is that he uh, sat just as somebody was sitting in Salah. Just as somebody was sitting in Salah. Which is known as Iftirash. You know, we sit in the position, uh, like this, right? That is known as Al Iftirash. So that seems to be stronger. That's how he sat in front of the Prophet. And I have heard some, Shaykh Ishaqi, he mentioned, Mutarabbi'an, i.e., cross legged. But he sat cross legged. Because if you sit cross legged, then also the knees touching could also take place um, as well. So any of these two, inshallah, are, are okay. So these are the two sittings, the way a person should be sitting and listen. Any other way should be avoided. You see some people stretching their legs out, some people legs going one, going left, one going right, I don't know. You know, some, some people are lying down, all of that should be uh, avoided. Stretching your, your feet out, you know, we mentioned this before, that you shouldn't be stretching your feet in a lesson. Right, it's not from etiquette. The only time you should be doing is, if you sat for a long time, your legs are hurting, no problem. Take it out for, you know, for a few seconds, even a minute, and then you, but you take it back in. It's not respectful for a person to have his legs stretching out uh, towards his teacher or towards anyone older or more respective than him, uh, whoever it may be. Right, and then on the next page, he says, وَقَالِ يَا مُحَمَّدِ He said, O oh Muhammad. And, you know, as he says here in the explanation, why did he say this instead of O oh Messenger of Allah? He mentioned, because he wanted to make himself seem like he's from the Bedouins, and that's how the Bedouins would address the Prophet uh, Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجَرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ That those that used to call you behind the, the rooms. So basically the Bedouins, what they would do is that outside of the house, outside of the room, they would say, Ya Muhammad, أُخْرُجْ لَنَا Oh Muhammad, come out to us. That's how they would address the Prophet Whereas Where the Sahaba, as they were commanded, is to call the Prophet by Ya Nabi Allah, O oh, oh Prophet of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, O oh Messenger of Allah. And that can be found in many other hadith also. Right, everything we've taken so far is basically introduction to the hadith. Like the introduction to what's going on. The actual question now starts on the next page. Page 151, which is Akhbirni an al-Islam. He now Jibreel alayhi salam says to the Prophet sallallahu inform me about Islam. Now, I don't think we've got enough time to go into the explanation of this, so we'll stop here, inshallah, for today. Um, next week, we'll continue uh, from Akhbarini Ani al-Islam. For those who are memorizing, I'll send the memorization, inshallah. All you need to memorize is the next part. فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ قَالَ أَنْ تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَةِ وَكُتُبِ رَسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنَ بِقَدِرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ تِلَّهِ just to answer until the end of Iman. That's all you need to memorize, inshallah. That's what you need to memorize for class. But obviously, if you're memorizing, my advice is go ahead. Because you're going to struggle. Especially later on when you're trying to memorize the references and stuff, you'll need a lot of time for revision. So if you can go ahead, go ahead, uh, inshallah. Any questions? No questions? Okay, we'll stop here, inshallah. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ilaha illa, astaghfiruka, wa